Hi, my name is Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So welcome this Thursday, the 30th of March 2023 for O'Day explaining Frank Polifka's wind hex. So thank you for joining me, Gordon Doherty, Drava Rajput, Terran Art, Artifact, Rob, Daniel Foster, Creating Awareness, Alan Cuss, great to have you here. Very important contrib contributor there, Alan. And uh, let's get this on the, on the road. Hi, yeah, we burn stuff and polygon. So uh, I'm still not going to do what I wanted to do with the... Um, the uh, how should we put it? I haven't got to doing my correction for my presentation last Sunday, and I will do that maybe at the beginning of uh, this Sunday's presentation. Do not miss this Sunday's presentation. Just saying. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I have not um, found the time to do the GEET discussion uh, explaining the anomalies. Uh, I am, like I say, going with the flow here. And as things come through the door, then I feel that is the way things should go. So why am I talking about the wind hex of Frank Polivka? Well, this is something that I saw a long time ago. Uh, didn't think too much of it. Uh, didn't know what to make of it. As I'm sure probably many of you also didn't know what to make of it, if you saw it before. Uh, however, after the last presentation uh, Chris Scott from Australia pointed out uh, it again and sent me a video and I go oh okay let, let, let's do this now uh, I think we can do this hi TP Sven and John Weir hi Opus so um, let's have a look at this uh, I did a little bit over oh, an overview here on remoteview.icu and I have a bunch of videos here uh, from this Still Point X website, uh, sorry, uh, YouTube channel. So thank you to Still Point X for collecting these things together. Interestingly, if you do go to his uh, YouTube channel, he does actually have an analysis of a geet there. So uh, obviously these things are connected and... Uh, in one of the descriptions, he has this little bit here, and he's talking about how essentially this Kansas farmer, you know, looked up at the skies and saw tornadoes and said, yeah, I want to see if I can make that. And uh, he came up with the concept to make it, and it seemed to work, even though he was told it probably wouldn't. And the things that I've highlighted in here, which I think are the most relevant to me is items to be processed are dropped into the top or tossed up from the bottom. The tornado-like vortex causes them to virtually explode. I'd kind of agree. I'd kind of agree. That is a good description. So the things that I really wanted to focus on here are tossed up from the bottom and virtually explode. And there's some discussion about uh, the temperature rising and so forth and that it can process all kinds of things and for those that haven't seen it I have prepared a bunch of slides here which go through these uh, various things and essentially there's some very cheesy music on this tornado in a can and so there is a discussion about cans here and it goes through and uh, discusses, look, you can see him right there throwing a, I think that was a glass bottle, silicon dioxide with a iron or, or metal cap, maybe an aluminium cap. And I think he does it a couple of times. There's another one, a glass bottle. And it gets thrown up into the wind hex. And uh, seconds later, it comes out as a fine powder. Look at that, a fine powder. How is that occurring? Another one, 
He's really going for it. There we go. That is what your bottle turns into very, very quickly. Why? Why is that happening? Now, he goes through a whole bunch of other things. Uh, he throws up some cans, and they come out as little pieces. And uh, then, then you get to see a whole load of other things. This is uh, hatchery waste, and it comes out as a dry powder. This is uh, egg, broken eggs. Uh, it's really not a very high quality video, uh, but it comes out as a dry powder. This is uh, broiler litter, that's broiler chicken litter, so uh, unpleasant stuff, comes out as a dry powder. And then they do some other things, and uh, this is a Windhex machine, there's better images you'll see in a little while. And in there are chicken feathers, and they put those in, and it comes out as something that you could probably stuff a pillow with dry and fluffy and then we've got other things going in uh, liquid egg comes out as powdered egg um, and more bottles going in they're just being thrown in through the top and coming out as powder and so that that's what you get from a silicon dioxide glass bottle you get like a powder a gray powder very very fine powder and this is what you get from an aluminium can. A grey, very fine powder. And wood goes in. Doesn't it, Wood survives a little bit more, interestingly. Uh, and uh, it can come out as a fine powder. And then you can uh, make particle board out of that. This is chicken hearts. Chicken hearts come out as dried powder. <laughs> All right, I think you get the idea. Chicken offal. Mmm, chicken offal. Now, you know, there's a lot of uh, Vietnamese people I know that would probably be looking at that um, chicken feet thinking, oh, what a waste. And again, it comes out as a powder, and apparently you can extract collagen from that quite easily. So, now... This next one, uh, I think, is wheat. So here, it's a whole wheat going to a very fine, nice, milled powder. Blah, 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 goes in there. Now, the inside of these things, when I was reading about it, you know, people were saying, oh, well, surely the inside would get uh, destroyed very quickly. No, I don't think it does. And... Uh, so it comes out and there's the milled powder going into a container. Fine white flour. Now, the next one, if it's going to give it to me, is it going to give it to me? Everyone knows the destructive power of a tornado during a summer storm. Now, Kansas inventor Frank Polisca has harnessed this power in a tornado machine. Some of the images you've already seen. Uh, this is uh, asparagus, asparagus, broccoli, uh, carrots, paprika, potatoes, uh, and other stuff. So. You know, I, I when I look at this, I think, well, I would like to uh, experimenting with different stuff. All over. Let's, let's see if I can pause it. this at the right point. With different sides. So, um, in the Czech Republic, uh, <laughs> there are apple trees everywhere, and I could basically pick as many apples as I liked. With one of these machines, if you could make a small one, uh, you could effectively desiccate those apples and form a powder which could probably be reconstituted into a nutritious drink uh, at any other point in the year. Um, the opportunities for preserving stuff or processing stuff so that it could be stored in an extremely rapid 
sense, um, you know, would uh, massively increase the uh, efficiency of food production, I believe. And I think that's what Mr. Uh, Polifica was trying to do. And it would seem that Kraft Foods uh, took over or maybe modified the patent or whatever. They seem to have got a patent. They've got a series of patents. Uh, some of them have already expired. Some of them are about to expire in a short period of time. But it's the next little clip that you see here that is very, very profound. And the reason it's profound is because, um, well, I, I, want, I want to see if you can guess it. But I'm going to, does, does anyone know how you make Portland cement? I mean, what do you need in Portland cement? Essentially, you need like chalk, calcium carbonate, and some clay. Normally, the calcium carbonate is, um, it's heated to remove the carbon dioxide and you get calcium oxide. And then that's that's lime, uh, quick lime. And then you uh, mix in clay powder. And in both cases, these ingredients need to be incredibly uh, mashed up. Okay. And then what you do is you, um, you slake that, you put it with water. And what happens is uh, crystals form. And that binds everything together. Now, of course, if you want to make, uh, um, you know, pug, as we call it in the UK, um, <laughs> mortar, you would mix in some sand. If you want to make concrete, you would mix in other scales of aggregate. I'm trying to recall all of my lay laying bricks and uh, and concrete floors and, and patios uh, days. So, so, so that's that's your cement and concrete. But you can you can actually also uh, do calcium carbonate, uh, heat it up uh, and slake it. And actually, if over a period of time, that will go back to um, calcium carbonate. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you imagine you had a huge limestone quarry uh, and you had a machine that could make a powder out of the calcium carbonate. Um, well, maybe you'd have the starting materials for, I don't know, a geopolymer. Oh, yes, crosshatch, yes. <laughs> yeah, you're getting it. <laughs> um, and so you'd just be able to carry easily. You could probably make a conveyor to carry stuff up and... and uh, you know, you could just mix it up at the top or maybe you could just, I don't know, put it in a bag and wait for it to get moist or, or whatever. But essentially, it's this recrystallization process. Now, what you're about to see in this next clip really struck home to me. Uh, and let's see if I can get the audio coming through as well with this. Not like that, I won't. So, everyone size Winhex machine and a variety of raw material. So what you are looking at here is old concrete and they're smashing it up and in fact it looks like someone's got some Portland cement that's been in a bag and gone hard and then what they do is they, they're just smashing it with a sledgehammer. They drop the pieces in. Okay this one is uh, recycled concrete. Recycled concrete. So this is the pulverized stuff that comes out of the bottom. So effectively, what this machine does is it smashes up stuff and removes the water. <laughs> and what do you need? It, how do you make cement? Well, like you, you get the calcium oxide, calcium carbonate. You heat it. You remove the carbon dioxide. You have calcium oxide. You you mix in, you know, some uh, um, clay powder which you also need to crush ordinarily but it would do that anyway and 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 then you just add the water and that does recrystallization well the funny thing is here we he says we add the magic sauce or whatever it is here
changed the molecular structure of that conflict, so it's turned into a very fast sending cement. Right, so uh, maybe there is some magic there, but I don't think you could w you could probably work out the chemistry quite quick if it just wasn't water, okay? So, um, it, it, essentially, you, you could m make ready building materials uh, using this technology, okay? So, in an interview, which I do recommend you listen to with the inventor uh, that I've also got on remoteview.ic, you can link from this guy's channel. Um, let's just see if there's anything else interesting here. These are chicken feet, chicken hearts. This is whatever. Okay, so everything everything becomes dry powder. Okay, all right. So on the, on the next one, this is the interview one, and uh, it's quite nice um, uh, because we have some much better quality images of some of these wind hexes. And they're collecting something there. We've got the uh, vortex tubes, which we've talked about. Um, and it's kind of based on that. Now, here's an image from a drawing or a patent from one of these type of devices. And you can see in this one, and this, this actually looks like the craft patent, which we'll look at. Material is put down, comes into the top of the structure here. Uh, and... It, it, they're saying it gets milled here and then it comes down all the way on the side and, and there's a, a, a vortex movement going up through here. Well, there is continuously high pressure air coming into the side with and without extra heat and with and without extra moisture and maybe even it can be dry steam coming in to there. So um, you can imagine with more stuff going in, the the water and the moisture and the gas has to go out somewhere well in theory it goes out the top and dry stuff comes out of the bottom so if, if it's coming all the way down here it, it isn't <laughs> it isn't the um water that's coming down here it's, it's not coming down here anyway so th this is the thinking about how it works and one would imagine if there was a lot of contact with the sides then it would be essentially destroying the steel or, or whatever of the uh, wind hex very quickly. And it would seem that that doesn't really occur. Now, Thomas Kaminsky was one of the first people after Alan Cusk that has joined here tonight to replicate an ultra experiment. And he sent me a video. And in that video... Um, there was uh, a sequence where you have this structure. There seemed to be a, a bright little ball here, and there seemed to be this bubble, uh, potentially of gas, and then this, well, essentially, what looked like a tornado coming out of the bottom. And this was in the free volume of the liquid. So... Thank you to Thomas Kaminsky for conducting the ultra experiment and for sharing the video with me from which I got this. And I included this as a uh, presentation title called Micro Tornadoes and Their Effects because according to Matsumoto, he believed that the thing that was causing his uh, observed phenomena uh, at least it sometimes included things that essentially produced micro, micro tornadoes and I had previously before I came across uh, the work of Matsumoto I had observed this structure in Lion when looking at the outside of the quartz liner where there appeared to be some sort of tornado structure that had a thing that appeared to make stuff into black stuff and it was alternating it was stepped which means it was kind of like at an angle, if you can imagine it, and one one cut through, and then it, as it went forward, and the other one cut through, and the other one cut through. So it ended up with this uh, type of spiral type boring through the s fused quartz. And there was this, and, and this looked remarkably similar to a damage mark recorded by Takaaki Matsumoto. And so we later then found out the vortex nature of the structures in 
ultra and we recorded the vortex natures and so forth so but when i look at this structure here in from in the top right here from the ultra experiment of thomas kaminsky you can see that essentially it's not too far off the shape and now maybe i can get both of these up in one frame and pr probably not it's not too far off Let, let's see if i can get that up can i get it up um ba -ba -ba -ba. sorry no laughing <laughs> can't get it up um let's kill that and i will bring that up here it's not too far off um this kind of conical shape that we have here on the feature from the ultra experiment here okay with the kind of tornado thing going down the bottom and the kind of shape that is going on uh, in the wind hex okay so what what is actually going on in the wind hex well uh, this is the patent uh, I think this is the original one um, September the 27th 2001 this particular one I think there was one from 1999 and I think there was another late, later pattern by uh, Polifka and then after that it all seemed to be things from um, Kraft making things for food consumption so here, here it is and uh, this particular one has three injections and the one thing that I note from it is not only does it come at an angle, it, it it's, it's, it's not, and it might be a perspective thing, but I don't think it's coming straight in. So it's coming in at an angle as well as, you, you know, both vertically and in the horizontal plane. Um, and that comes into this box here. And the box, if we look at it down here, there's three of them in this instance. Now, some of the videos show four around the outside. You never see two, um, but three and four seem to be the number which they have. And um, if you look at it from the side, so we're looking at this this one here, okay, uh, the, where, which is circled for the expanded blow-up view, then the air that's coming in in two axes at an angle the high pressure potentially heated and potentially moisture modified water comes in and it has to, has to go through an adjustable slot okay and it's almost like the um reed on a how should we put this a reed on a clarinet or even a whistle you can imagine but kind of in reverse so you can imagine that as it comes in here through this little knife edge you're going to get uh, intense sound being produced and it might even be ultrasonic so i predict that there is a large amount of sound in this as it's coming in and it's coming in at extreme speed now behind as that comes in it's going to create a vacuum here that's going to pull this airflow from other parts of the chamber in but this is going to be higher temperature and it's going to be more potentially filled with moisture that means and i will show you where you you can learn that this is the case this will be able to move at a much faster speed than this and this will create a vortex okay and it will create a vortex street because it'll have to tear off from time to time okay and then if you look at this and you rotate that, so actually the, the top of the chamber is here and the bottom of the chamber is on the right. So the top of the chamber is on the left and the bottom of the chamber is on the right. It's actually a slot. So what it's going to be doing as it comes in here, it's going to be producing this kind of wall of fast moving air with this wall of slow moving air. And it's going to create a torus here. And it's probably going to create a counter torus okay now as this happens here and it happens here and it happens here you're going to get this incredible turbulent stream going on here okay but because the tori that it's producing are effectively vertical there will be a 
because the water will is polar and because it'll gone through friction it will be charged and because uh, the sound going on there will be self-organization you will get uh, a mini vortex in each of these t toroidal structures these cylindrical structures that will then cause a vortical flow here now what we know is we're putting in more air and more moisture and stuff in here and it has to go somewhere and we know that the heavy stuff falls down here and the gases come out here okay which means uh, you know it's it's got it, it's kind of got to go down here now does it does it go up and round there's a vortex here uh whatever I, it doesn't really matter what we can see in a minute is that it, whatever's happening in my view is the same thing that's happening in the ultra experiments and it is the same thing that we have seen in many many other systems and it is the same thing that happens in the pyramid <laughs> okay so what i would and, and given that th th this is the case this should be able to be miniaturized now there is questions about the temperature and and so forth and how you get the air pressure in there but i could imagine that if you had compressed air or you had steam in a tank and and you released a valve on that be careful steam can be extremely dangerous um uh, the expansion and so forth that there is potential ways to do this with just steam in a pressure vessel or or you actually see in some of the patents where they just have a big blower and the blower goes through a constricted you know uh, um port and uh that actually does the job it depends on the level of the milling you require now i'm b before i go into a little bit more detail on this i want to show you if i can find it by the way um a paper that was produced by someone interested in taking sweet potatoes and producing dried powdered sweet potatoes in a way that preserved a lot of their nutritional content because if i'm going to convert my mushrooms that i harvest in the winter and my fruit that i harvest in the autumn if i'm going to convert those into dry products i can use throughout the year i don't want to be losing losing all the nutrition in there so i want to know that this works i also want to know what it looks like under the microscope so if you just bear with me i'll see if they can dig that out So, uh, this paper was done by uh, Nashimiyamina Emmanuel, uh, application for wind hex dehydration technology for producing beta carotene rich flowers from sweet potatoes. Okay, and I think this was in Vietnam, now maybe, because it's under Trong, or Trong sounds uh, Vietnamese to me. Uh, they do have a lot of sweet potatoes in Vietnam. But on page 100, if we go through this blah, 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 blah. So uh, they're producing the different flowers here. And they show that depending on the temperature, it's better to have the temperature at 110 degrees. Uh, you end up with 87.78% of the carotenoid in there in the, in the desirable form. And this is quite comparable to a much more complicated process of freeze drying okay so it's faster it's almost a single step process you basically wash the stuff and then throw it in you don't have to dry it and grind it and and, and then freeze dry it uh, or vice versa um, and then they go through here is the uh, apparatus so essentially in their one they've got an air compressor it goes through a heat exchanger to heat the gas it then goes in uh, through these ports, okay, and they feed in the uh, the sweet potato along with the uh, heat as well. The the the, the spare um, pressurized gas actually helps feed the sweet potato stock in, and out comes the lovely orange powder down here. So that's the basis of the technology, and. Um, 
if I come down, it's the SEMs of the various technologies that I am interested in here. And also the particle size. Actually, does it have it in here? It's normally, it was in page one, one. Yeah, down here, I think in page 100. There, okay. So here is um, the normal sort of dehydration type technology. And they just look like chips, like broken chips. It's been milled. Uh, this is again dehydration. Uh, and again, you've got these chips of various scales. So this is 100 micron scale there. We've got a 100 micron scale there. Uh, this is freeze drying. And these are much larger chips, it would seem. 100 micron scale there. This is freeze drying again, 100 micron scale. And these are bit mostly flakes. Yeah, mostly flakes, little chips, and uh, flaky chips, right? Here is the um, wind hex at 110. What I noticed in this, uh, and I don't know whether it's clear to you, is there are some chunks like this, okay? But there are a lot of little spheroid type structures all over the place. Little spheres, little spheres, little spheres, little spheres, little spheres, little spheres. And they say that the particle size that comes out of the wind hex, and the, the higher the temperature is, the smaller. So this is actually the larger of the particle size with these, is a small and, and often one micron. And that's very interesting because I read a report once which said that it's very unlikely that natural processes that normally use, or used by man for processing materials and a lot of other natural processes find it hard to get particles below 5 microns. So this process is able to get things to literally 1 micron. And if that's kind of an average, there's an even smaller than that. So, um, but... I think they went for the, the 110 because it's not making it too small. But there's definitely a lot of much smaller particles in here. And they tend to look like they're going towards being spheroids. You definitely don't see it here. You definitely don't see it here. You, th these have got some little fragments. But if you can imagine that, you know, once you free dr freeze dried something or whatever, I don't know. But um, I don't see these are chips rather than being more like spheroids. Okay, so, but for me, the interesting thing as, as someone who likes preserving uh, vegetables and, and, and fruit and stuff from the times of plenty, uh, this, this is great. Now, here is the particle size distribution chart. And you see you've got the normal dehydration, the freeze de dehydration, and so on, and, and the milling processes that are typically used in industry. And then you've got the wind hex here. And the, this is the volume medium diameter in microns, okay? And for the, I think it's the, the, the 110 process, you can see that the, the, the mean is quite a lot lower. And so in this case, the, the peak of the size of the particles for the uh, wind hex is around 70 microns. Um, but uh, in fact, actually, this dehydration process and milling, you've got some particles that are quite quite small as well. Okay, But the other processes, the bulk of them are higher. In, and so, for instance, in this uh, drying method, it's like 200 microns on the peak there this one's like 170 this one's like 130 so it's by far the smallest on the bulk of the number of particles that are produced which is interesting because what they say about the wind hex is the longer you can leave it in there i.e if you change the rate at which it, it it's uh, controlling the inflow and the outflow of the gases you can end up with it getting smaller and smaller particles okay so I'm going to see if I can dig out a couple of the patterns, uh, the, the ones from um, the, uh, who was it, from Kraft Foods. Uh, we'll put that one there. 
That's the original. <laughs> yeah, so this particular one I think is by Kraft Foods. Um, and they have a whole bunch of people listed as the inventors, but it's clearly the same technology. Uh, and this is going to shortly run out of patent because it's 14th to the 10th, 2004. So uh, we can all make our temporary devices and then have our businesses running on making processed food from otherwise what people would consider as waste. And if you go through this, blah, 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 there's some drawings at the end and you can see it's very, very familiar. Hot air generator, blower, goes into an air heater and that goes into the Windhex device type thing. The stuff you want to process goes in here and out drops your dried and so-called milled um, material at the bottom. It's an incredibly simple device. In my view, it's very robust because the, uh, like the... Um, rare refraction pulse heat generator that is produced in a number of Eastern European countries and in Russia for producing excess heat. The the actual process that is doing the work is within the fluid volume. It's not at the boundaries, in my view. Uh, so, the and, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a second. Okay, so um, give me a sec. I have some graphics for you. Photoshop to be up. Okay. So, um, there's three, uh, I think, very relevant, but with, there's many that are relevant. Um, structures that I think help describe this very well. Um, and it actually doesn't matter what's going on at the top because I think we know what is actually going on and we can work out what's going on by seeing uh, how this fits with our sacred geometry structure. And what we know is that the, the fluid dynamics of this will be something similar to what we've witnessed in various systems. So um, I've got one more thing I want to put in here. Give me a second. All right. Actually, before I do this, I want to share something that was uh, sent to me by Simeon Hain. I'm going to add this uh, reference to the group of references uh, in this uh, Remote View blog. I just need to find the reference that I'm talking about. <laughs> so give me a second. Sorry. So, okay. All right. Let's do that here. So... This is an incredible, incredible um, reference. It's called The Electromagnetic Nature of Tornadic uh, Supercell Thunderstorms. So thank you, Simon Hain, for sending this to me. I've basically not read any of this, uh, essentially. 
other than a little bit around water spouts because I am interested uh, in things that are able to lift up water and there is a talking about water spouts down here and this is off the coast of Albania wonderful Albania we'll be talking about Albania soon um, but anyway um, and they've got some crazy crazy images here going into the turbines of various uh, jet aircraft and the fact that these all come down to a point they come down to a point and the fluid dynamics simulations do not have them coming to a point something is wrong with the fluid dynamics simulations they do not show what you observe and he's got a whole the, this is very very uh, uh comprehensive this uh, particular um document and i'll see if i can find the ones that i'm looking for which is up here somewhere 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 it's an absolutely brilliant document so i highly highly recommend uh you go and have a look at this and i i will find it <laughs> oh dear i had it a few minutes ago okay these are some kind of water spouts no 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 look at that it's beautiful you have to you have to admire they are a thing of great beauty it's all the same thing <laughs> oh dear oh i think we're getting into it now yeah somewhere up here right okay all right um it's it's these water spouts here now i didn't read the text um i'm not looking at the pretty girl in the room when i look at this i'm not looking at this thing that's coming down here i immediately looked at the huge six that's on the ocean here and the blacker area on the outside okay then i looked at this one wow look at this this is the same pattern that matsumoto observed in his lena experiments and it is the same thing that we have observed on hutchison samples that we have observed on Henk urine samples, that we have observed on a plethora of different examples. Okay? And we know some of them are in air, some of them are in plasma, some of them, but often there's going to be charges involved. I'm, for, I'm pretty certain that there are charges involved. Okay? Now, if you actually look at it here, I'm going to read this bit and it doesn't scale well, so um, maybe I can do that. And now it's gone somewhere different so i'm going to go back where i was <laughs> it says central to the present hypothesis is the assertion that the tornadic inflow is attracted to the earth by electric force and can only develop a vortic vertical velocity once its charge has been neutralized by the electric current inside the vortex there is in fact evidence of just such attraction of the inflow to earth it's most obvious when the cyclonic inflow inscribes a pattern on the water so it wasn't just me that spotted this and it wasn't just you guys that spotted this okay um water spout with banded inflow courtesy of nws darker water means faster winds darker water darker water means faster winds again here figure 76 water spout with banded inflow off the florida keys 1969 credit joseph golden courtesy of noaa notice the flares indicating that the prevailing surface winds are not part of the inflow so these areas are not playing a role somehow there is extremely fast winds occurring in this vortex part here because these are not being sucked around with it okay and the argument goes on here the cyclonic pattern makes sense as this is what we would expect for any suction vortex such a uh, such a uh, as a tropical cyclone as in figure 39 but on closer scrutiny there are some things about these photographs that really don't make sense if these are just suction vortices to start we can clearly see a distinct channel of darker water 
that spirals inwards. Since darker water means faster winds, this reveals a channel of air that is moving much faster than the surrounding air. In fact, the flares in figure, 70, uh, figure 76 reveal that the air outside of the channel isn't even part of the inflow. This is definitely not what we would expect in a suction vortex. This is not a suction vortex. In fluid dynamics, channeling this evidence of differences in viscosity, viscosity, if all the air has the same viscosity, it is all subject to the same friction. Any air moving faster will experience more friction, so we expect a self-regulated consistency of in the inflowing speed. But if some of the air has a lower viscosity, it will experience less friction and therefore it will tunnel through the higher viscosity air put more mechanic mechanistically uh, put more mechanistically starting from the low pressure at the mouth of the vortex ordinarily air would flow in from all directions but if some of it has a lower viscosity that air will flow faster in response to the low pressure when the particle when the, sorry, when the parcel shifts inwards, the low pressure left behind it will be filled by air from all directions, unless some of that air has a lower viscosity, in which case the channel extends even further away. In this way, the inflow channel can extend all of the way from the vortex to the source of the lower viscosity air, discussed in section entitled Rear Flank Downdrafts. Normally, there are only two factors responsible for the viscosity of air, temperature and humidity. Now, what is the claimant changing here? He's raising the temperature and varying the humidity, okay? Of the two, temperature is more significant. So he has this chart here where you have the kinematic viscosity of the air and you can see if you go from 0% to 100% humidity but don't change the temperature, it's a fairly minor change. It's it, the second decimal place and only by, well, so it's basically a third decimal place, not a lot. But if you just raise the temperature by 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or actually it's less than this, it's like uh, it's 18 degrees Fahrenheit, you get a, sec a first decimal place change practically. Okay, it's much, much uh, bigger um, it's like uh, 0.09 or something like that by changing the temperature. So the te temperature change is the biggest factor. However, he's saying, but within the relevant ranges of temperature and humidity, this is relevant for what may be going on in the ocean, we only get a 6% difference in viscosity. And we're seeing much more than 6% difference in velocity, in velocity. This rules out fluid dynamics explanation. So the only possibility is the that this is one of the effects of the electric force. And in fact, if the air is charged, electrostatic repulsion within the air will prevent the particles' collisions uh, that fr instantiate friction, there, thereby reducing the viscosity. Right. What did uh, Anatoly Klimov uh, invent back in the 1990s? The kind of idea of firing a laser out in front of your missile or your high-speed aircraft to create turbulent flow. Well, that's one thing. But if it's creating charged particles, ions in front, they will like organize in a way and, and, and interact with the body of the aircraft in a much, much different way. So when you are injecting moist material into the reactor it's got water water is polar there's going to be friction there's going to be sound there's going to be self-organization this will in my view lead to charges being formed and you have an electrical process a self-organizing fractal toroidal electrical structure in my view will form 
Far more significantly, the electrostatic reduction in viscosity also explains why charged air attracted to the induced opposite charge at the surface of the Earth can flow into the vortex faster than neutral air just above it. In other words, in the in top view, we see discrete flow channel that can only be explained as charged air tunneling through neutral air. So, one of the potential implications of applying this learning to the uh, wind hex is that you could actually have an ionization an ionizer in the stream of air coming in and it could move even faster okay and it's a source of this low viscosity air so it will go in and the vortex itself will pull it in as well as it going in okay so it's kind of self-reinforcing yeah, yeah, there is there is an explosion risk, yes, uh, and it le levels it's levels of ionization. It depends on how dry the air is as well. So okay, but like I say, the friction and and the sound and everything will cause this to uh, self organize. Okay, so I would ask if people could spend a bit of time reading this document and get back to me with any interesting tidbits. It is ridiculously long and extremely detailed. It's 161 pages, not including images. Okay, so it's quite large. It's basically a book. Okay, so um, that's that. Uh, so I, I then want to go and show you fluid dynamics. So we have alien scientists work here. And this has smoke particles in it. So these are very fine particles of dense matter in a fluid. And this is a laser cut through the uh, soliton. Okay, so we are talking a fluid here. So there's some slow action coming here. There's no action on the side. So if you had thing on the sides here, they would just kind of fall down, wouldn't they? They would fall down in a cone. Okay. Right, but the, there's a bit of suckage going on here. You might call it suckage. Now, this was the first time that I saw this process in action in 2017 in Suhas Ralkar's lab in Mumbai, caught with an, in an ultrasonic town tank. So this is a air fluid. This is a liquid fluid, and our mixture in our wind hex is liquid and air and particles. Okay. And what I noticed was in this area, there is a depressurization. And I thought, that's really curious. Something is coming down from here that at this point depressurizes this so much that it produces the bubbles behind it. And it's pulling in material from a distance. And it wasn't until I analyzed uh, last year uh, Hank Uren's quartz, quartz, I saw this. And this is the caduceus. Uh, vortex coming down, we have our off angle uh, um, interaction of our fractal toroidal structure with the material and you have some material that comes up to a point up here, okay? But this is a beam of stuff that is being interacted with in fused quartz, quartz, okay? So this is silicon dioxide, this is water that is being influenced, okay and this this is effectively pulling material through the center of the vortex and this is particulates in air now the one that shocked me the most is this one which i've talked about greatly this is fully charge separated water like it's it's ions of hydrogen ions of oxygen uh, uh, uh hydroxy ions burning uh HHO in the form of a Mars gas, which is a complex gas. It's not quite as simple as just a stoichiometric mixture of gas. And it is disrupting in milliseconds. It's producing an intense fractal toroidal structure that in milliseconds is disrupting tungsten, one of the hardest materials known to man, with the second highest melting point after carbon itself. And it appears to be synthesizing elements. And it has this almost uh, uh, event horizon-like boundary where there's no effect whatsoever. No effect whatsoever. But the most interesting thing for me was this zone down here. And we have this sphere. And from the sphere, which is something like strontium-rich, um, we have this 
carbon film, this diamond-like film, it's being totally torn apart. It frightened the bejeebas out of me when I first saw this because, you know, this is a real thing. It's undeniable. It is what it is. It is the OM. It is, it is the result of this fractal toroidal moment. And so what we have shown here is you can manipulate things with water in it. This is all with water in it. <laughs> and move material up through the central channel. You can actually destroy glass, okay? And you can actually destroy one of the hardest metals, one of the highest temperature melting point. This is not melting point that's doing this, by the way. You can destroy uh, the, uh, metal. So, when... Um, uh, the claimant here, uh, if I can properly credit him, uh, the claimant Frank Polivka is showing its ability to pulverize or powderize silicon dioxide and pulverize and powderize aluminium and pulverize and powderize concrete effectively because basically concrete is is aggregates of silicates and 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 stuff in uh, uh cement and we've shown the other two bits being broken up like metals and other things so basically it's going to mash everything up into fine fine particulates it's going to smash everything that you'd want to build a building from for instance into fine particulates okay and so uh, with that in mind, I want to show you how his patent drawing, this patent drawing, it, does it fit the pattern that we have seen in this process? I would argue, yes. Boom! What am I looking at here? This is our sacred geometry structure. Boom. Boom. The area that the material comes up into the calm center and just a little bit of upflow, a little bit of upflow here, okay? The two core vorti cores of the two vortices either side are just outside where the uh, um, fins are. And the destruction zone, the destruction zone where tungsten is torn apart is just above the bottom. It's just above the bottom. So, when you see this guy, when you see him doing this, uh, it's not a, an accident. When, I, when you see this... Everyone knows the destructive power of a tornado during a summer storm. Now... Kansas inventor Frank Polifka has harnessed this power in a tornado machine. Do you see what he just did then? Everyone knows the destructive power of a tornado during a summer storm. Now, Kansas inventor Frank Polifka has harnessed this power in a tornado machine. I judge that the distance that he's able to throw that up is not that high. Okay. And within a very, very small number of seconds, he's collecting the dust. Okay? This is smashing up anything. And I believe it's doing it at this point, predominantly. We know that over here, it's still quiet area. Things will just fall down. Okay? Here, it's smashing it up. Okay? So there we go. That is the overall structure. So in this whole area here, basically things get mashed. Now, so in some of the technology, they 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 push the stuff down here, and it comes into this part of the vortex. Okay. But this, for me, is the area that basically makes it. As he he said himself, the stuff basically explodes and explodes. And I, I, I argue this. When I, when I looked at this, I'm, th I'm thinking it's so depressurized some way, somehow, that the matter just separates from itself. 
Uh, and I believe that it's interacting with the electrons. It's interacting with the electrons. The toroidal moment produces a, a, a forward toroidal moment, but downwards it produces a disruption beam. And the disruption beam will cause electrons to lose their attachment to other uh, 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 atoms, and the matter just falls apart. And in the case of water, in the Great Pyramid, if we were to, for instance, put a, a picture, this isn't the best one, but we'll, we'll put a picture of uh, the pyramid in there here. And we'll do it so that we can actually see it. Um, we need to change it, okay. We, we know from the better drawing. So, so the still point of calm here, okay, uh, here rather, is where that's coming up. But this is the disruption zone. This is the disruption zone. Okay. And so we can see it here. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence. So the, the, this, the disruption would be in here, okay? And it's the sacred geometry. Now, uh, I'm going to see if I can find this, but one of his... If, if I've shown you the the marks on the copper just outside the 15 millimeter ball lightning, when you only had two structures, it produces like a bar galaxy structure, okay? And if you can imagine you've got two pegs and you get some fairly stiff, like, stick and you want to bend it round there. If you've only got two pegs, it's going to want to kink and bend and go into, like, a bar galaxy type shape or, like, like a, a an ovoid. If you've got three, as in this pattern here, uh, that this drawing is from, then it's going to more closely resemble a circle. And if you've got four, which some of his devices have, four injector points for the uh, uh, high, high, high pressure temperature bit of moisture air to go in then if you've got four then it will much much closer uh, represent a circle with that stiff rod that you're kind of trying to put round so i'm going to try and find something which was the cover slide uh, for my um sochi seek and share presentation okay so just just bear with me let's see if i can find that try to find it earlier Okay, I have it here as a PDF, I think. Uh, not that one. Okay, so uh, this was my Seek and Share presentation and <clears throat> Um, it will be in a second, uh, that I gave on the 4th of October 2018, and I chose this structure uh, on the right here. So these are some, I think they're Iron Age, and they're all over these rocks in northern Italy, and about four or 500 meters away from where I interned my grandmother's, on my mother's side, ashes on Ilkley Moor, there is a almost exactly the same structure and this is meant to be according to the myth um, the symbol that some sun worshipping uh, sort of people thought was important 
But essentially what you've got is you've got a, a vertical vortex here and a vertical vortex because you've got a toroid here and a toroid here. This produces, uh, so basically you've got a torus and a torus. And they produce a torus around there, and you, that produces a torus around the outside. And that produces your caduceus spiral. Uh, this produces your beam that goes down the middle. This, my friends, is exactly the same phenomena you are seeing in this uh, uh, wind hex. Okay? This is the symbol of how all of these technology works. This is a three... Uh, um, it's it's a representation of a fractal torus uh, structure and in my view this is a representation of a uh, so you've got one two three so it, it's got all three axes represented okay so this is not new this is a technology that was known all over the world wherever you've seen something that looks a bit like an auspicious symbol so when I was in India, my staff would do these Mandela uh, um, pieces of art every year. And they would, you know, get all these flowers and stuff. And you would often see these auspicious symbols correctly drawn with the two spots either side of the arms. Correctly drawn with both two spots either side of the arms. Okay. Uh, I, I'll answer questions in a little while. I, I just just want to go back. So, so basically, th this this is a representation of the technology. Uh, and in in my seek and share presentation, uh, I saw and showed. Uh, you know, in the Lion Reactor, we had. Uh, well, th this is actually in some of the work that I did from Suhas Ralkar. This is where I got that original vortex that that we were looking at there a little while ago. Uh, you, maybe it's somewhere here, actually. I don't know. Is it going to go? Not a pleasant noise, even when it's slowed down. Anyway, um, lots to learn from that. But it, it was in the uh, lion experiment where we saw uh, three, two, three, uh, four point and five point structures and we've seen six and eight in in vega since okay so in his patent here he's and in the other patent if we if we go here he's just going three and i think that's the bare minimum for uh, a practical device using fractal toroidal uh, uh destruction technology okay and uh this i believe would give you access to the production of geopolymers but this I um, this might literally blow your mind. I was talking about how you could make a device using this technology to manipulate material. Since we could, you know, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. But this is real. This actually happened. I might be wrong, but you know what? This is real. This this actually happened. This 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 uh, uh, all these three thing, things here actually happened. They are what nature does with a vortex. Okay. It's not just about what goes up up here, and it's not just what goes on in between. It's this particular focusing zone down here, particular focusing zone where I believe. Mr. Polifka is throwing those materials and where I believe a lot of the really incredible destruction occurs. Okay? Where it did occur on this piece of tungsten. So I believe that potentially you could make a device and, and you know, this is not big, guys. This structure is 50 microns across and it's what, like, maybe... Uh, 80 or 90 microns down but this area here my friends this little bit where the destruction is occurring if that's 30 then that is three microns that's five microns across five microns across okay and outside here there's no destruction at all occurring and here there's every destruction at all <laughs> like, it's all destruction here, and there's no destruction here. It's an event horizon, 
okay? So we have something that can cut to micron diameters, and we know we can make these smaller, but this is damaging tungsten, right? So if you've got something as hard as tungsten, not a problem. So could we develop miniaturized devices that rather than having this bit enclosed in the tunnel, it's a bit like a ballpoint pen, yeah? The destruction area, just the edge of the event horizon, is not enclosed in here, but it, it just, it just, the event horizon just comes out the edge. Is that possible? Could that be possible to do? And if it was possible, you could use this as an unimaginable tool for carving, for cutting rocks out of mountain sides, all kinds of things. Is this possible? And I rather like this idea of having a controlled like pen-like structure, which you could just carve rock, right, with, um, than, than having the sphere dialed up to 100 and it just destroys everything, you know, within that sphere. Okay? So, I believe that this, and, and in fact, he actually talks that at some point he could imagine people having these devices in their home. Well, I can imagine that no one would want you to have these devices in your home when you work out what they can do. When, when you work out that probably they are exactly what caused the pyramid to do its magic. Okay? This is the disruption area. Okay, and in my view, it is interacting with the spin of the electrons and also the protons. Uh, and it's tearing the hydrogen and oxygen apart. I believe this is probably the reason for some HHO generators to be more efficient because they create these vortex structures. And then the vortex structures are more efficiently separating the water. And so you get a net energy gain uh, because it's it's not using it's not having to go through the normal way of separating water, okay? And so uh, I would describe this, and I would describe everything as I'm talking about here and have been talking about as Atlantean technology. And I think there are those that know that this is what the Atlantean technology was. Because... You can lift things, you can process things, you can probably make geopolymers, you can carve things. You can go uh, relatively forward in time, you can perceive time through, you know, I'll talk about this another time, but you, you can see the history of an event, but I, I don't believe you can actually move yourself back into the past. You can see the recording in the Akashic Record, as I've t described with the Integratron. So I, I actually believe when Joe Parr, was talking about the um, the the uh, pyramid being able to have it in such a state that you'd be able to go forwards and backwards in time. Uh, I I argued in my presentation about that that I I can understand how you can go forward in time and I've described that a lot, but I don't know I, and I do not think you can go backwards in time. When I reflected on that a short while after the presentation ended, I thought, well, I do know that you can potentially use this zone in there to interact with the Akashic record through the toroidal moment that's generated, okay? And be kind of in tune with it. And, you know, literally plugged into the Akashic record on an extreme level. And I talked about that in my presentation on the Integnatron. Well, I thought, Oh, given the fact that he was into communications, he invested the, invested or worked with this guy that worked with Juan Preron making this uh, communication system, which, by the way, I've actually got a copy of the 1950s journal, which that was in. It arrived. Oh, sorry, it's arriving tomorrow, and I will share that uh, possibly next week. Um, the article that the, 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 the guy who did the thing from prayer on and it's cited by so many communications patterns so many patterns so obviously it's it's polyphasic conversion to to uh, amplitude mod modulation polyphasic mm, i wonder what that is and i was thinking could this be something to do with fractal toroidal communication methods that can go through 
I don't know, not normal electromagnetic waves. I don't know. And then you can convert that back into something that is able to go into electromagnetic waves. That was what was going through my head when that, I was reading that bit about um, this guy's uh, uh, this guy that worked with pre uh, Perrin. And so uh, then when he was talking about going back in time, I thought, well, actually, after the presentation, I thought, well, maybe he actually meant you're looking back in time, looking at this record. And so I've been doing some work investigating the work of Joe Parr and I came across a, a, a reference and this actual, this actual reference led me to go and get the document that I did in my last presentation last night on whenever it was um, on the, uh, um, the research of Joe Parr in, that was published in uh, the Electric Space Craft Journal. And thank you to the curators there. But uh, what I'm going to show you now, uh, and he, he, he actually verified Parkamov's work before Parkamov did Parkamov's work without realizing it. But what I'm going to show you now, I think you might find uh, quite amusing. Because I was thinking to myself, um, if you look at the Integratron, if we go to that, I'm going to go to the thing. And we go to the Integratron. Uh, Integra. Okay, I'm going to spell it wrong. Integratron. No, 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 no. Oh, gold. Uh, uh, give me a second. Here we go. So this is my article on the Integratron by George Van Tassel. And I argued that this was a dark matter accumulator. It was a fractal toroidal structure as, you know, it, it's kind of built with the understanding. And, and so I took this photo. I calculated that it did have 48 divisions around it where these things were meant to, some electrical thing was meant to be hung off these poles. And it has a Tesla coil in there. And so I proposed that this was the structure. It produced a fractal toroidal moment. It happens to be exactly the right ratio to have these four d, uh, fractal 4D, uh, D4D 4D structures in there. And so I thought, you know what? He's describing going forward and backwards in time. And I thought, it, does he mean like I kind of projected that he he was, that the, the, I think that um, Van Tassel was describing and, and so I came across this site, and, and, and down the bottom of it, this is, this is on geezerpyramid.com. There was a, a, a link here, down the bottom here. I don't know if you can see it, but it says contributors to Joe Parle's research. And I thought, I think I know what I'm going to find when I click on this. I think I'm going to know what I find. So I clicked on it, and you know what? At the top of that link is George Van Tassel. Yep. George Van Tassel. Contributors to my research. George Van Tassel. So there we go. I believe that uh, Mr. Van Tassel here, bearing in mind he says the secret to the universe is 1 over F. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you can understand that if you have fractal toroidal structures and each toroid is 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 uh, going to the next level of frequency the next level of frequency that is like essentially becoming one over f isn't it so um and the other one here is this is the paper the polyphase pattern which i'm going to be able to share with you probably uh, early next week okay so and um, this is dr brian d vermani okay so these are the people so it was it was literally not a surprise in the world when i saw that I kind of worked out how he might have meant that you could go back through time. And yes, I agree. You can go back through time and, and, and he described it. Go back through time and see how the pyramid was built. But you can't be there influencing how it was built. You can just see the memory. You can just see the memory of how it occurred. So, therefore, I believe we are dealing with... Uh, Atlantean technology and I believe that it has been known for many many years and 
they like to rub your face in it. If you want to go and have your face completely rubbed into how much they know about this technology and how much they are laughing at you as they find ways of deploying it and maybe pretending uh, you know, they've got a problem and it's intractable, which they can easily solve with this technology, easily solve with this technology, but you're not allowed to have it because you could imagine, you could imagine that, you know, if you could create this structure in midair, then we already know it has been proven that it can mash up tungsten, aluminium, silicon dioxide, literally concrete, and 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 uh, uh, cement it can mash up a building into micron and if it stays in the structure long enough and it's powerful enough it will pulverize it into gray powder very fine gray powder can't think where i have seen that happen before anyway uh that's what it can do so why would they want you to have one in your house where someone might put their kitchen knife up in there and it starts chewing the end off and then they go oh what happened to that <laughs> uh, and start thinking not allowed to think not allowed to think but this might make you think this is slide 100 from oday which i don't believe i've shared yet i might have done but i don't think i have future proves past there are no coincidences. This is the head offices of Science Applications International Corporation, SAIC. In San Diego. And you may know that the Cluster Impact Fusion Technology was transferred to SAIC in 1992. And the uh, Psychic Spy Program was transferred to SAIC. One was from um, Stanford Research International. And I think that both of them were Stanford Research International. And essentially, this is a quasi-private institution. Because it's private, you can't do a Freedom of Information Act on it. So everything that's important is not in, an in, in a place where it can have an FOI on it. And the, here we have Tom DeLong in, in 2017 on the 26th of October saying, for example, the sixth biggest defense contractor, at, at least they used to be the sixth, is a company called Science Applications International Corporation. These guys visited John Hutchison. Their headquarters are actually in San Diego and in front of the building you have an obelisk. Yes not giving homage to the Egyptians at all, coming out of the fake lake, and two Atlantean thrones. And they're holding pyramids. One says the past, and one says the future. And they're eight-foot-tall statues. It's beep nuts, by the way. Yes, they're holding a pyramid. And the guy with the Arab headdress is looking down upon the pyramid in contemplation. And the one on the right is an ultra-modernistic uh, uh, female figure looking up to the pyramid uh, uh, in a kind of visionary sense. That's where we're going to be. That's, that's what we should be thinking about. And that's where we should be. And where do we see an obelisk? Oh, could it be in St. Peter's Square in front of the Vatican? Hmm. Yeah, this is the past. This is the future. And I would probably bet my, a, a, at least a dollar, that if you took these two structures and this point here, and you'd look at an aerial photo... I wouldn't be surprised if it was it, it lined up in some way with this structure that we're talking about. I would I would it would not surprise me. Okay? Maybe someone can do that. So Polygon, I'm gonna look at your questions now. Could the wind hex be used to refine crude oil? I think it could break it down uh into smaller particles. This effectively is what what you are looking at here in the 
in my diagrams here, effectively, in the wind hex here, is the toroidal, fractal toroidal vortex part here, this is in the, the cupped section of the so-called north pole in a GEET reactor. And it has this beam that comes down, and as the, as the uh, fuel comes down here, it actually gets to this point, and it actually gets ripped apart, okay? And some of it gets recycled and stuff until it just falls down by the side. So this is essentially what's going on in, in a GEET reactor as well. Um, and so, yes, it, it can split up uh, oil. So... Uh, Rob is asking, would the Windex produce strange radiation whilst uh, disassembling? Um, I think that because it's not completely destroying the matter, because it's actually, it, and this might seem um, a little funny to say, it's quite gentle. The, the Windex is quite gentle. This is not gentle. An ultra experiment is not gentle. You, you know, within... Uh, 90, 90 seconds, we were able to create coherent matter that was able to leave tracks on the aluminium, instantaneously train, changing it where it interacted with the aluminium, okay? So there are beams coming out. This, in, in fractions of a second, is uh, able to tear apart tungsten and synthesize other elements. But actually, this is quite gentle, in my view. And I think the pyramid is actually quite gentle in the way, in my view, that it is splitting the water and it comes up as a gas and it, the, the, the magic goes on in here because it's a fractal structure. What you're looking at here over, overall, it's the same thing that's going on in the subtor, but the subtor is working at another level, okay? So this is splitting, uh, disassociating water down here. But up here, it's breaking the nuclei apart, okay? And, and in part, it's aided by, in my view, the radio, uh, um, uh, the ionizing radiation coming from the granite. And like I said, when you've got the ions, things get really funky with this kind of system, okay? That's why you've got PAR injecting, you know, 360,000 uh, electrons or ions into his chamber, Okay, that's why you have the radioactive source. It creates these monopole type structures and they can cause the overall work to be done. Okay, so um, I think it's quite gentle when it comes to, you know, uh, it, it, this, this is fairly extreme. The HHO is more extreme and it's, this is just shear forces. I mean, shearing forces uh, and it's, it's producing the same effect uh, that the shearing forces are producing in uh, the wind hex okay it's it's in my mind it is there is no doubt in my mind that this is the process that's going on and knowing this and knowing the structure that causes it and knowing that you need at least two but it's not really you could probably get away with two but you want at least three as he's got a pattern i, I expect he tried to make one with two but the the center uh, uh cylinder got damaged so he made three and he made ones with four you know, I, I, I would follow those pre-Christian uh, stone carvers from northern Italy. And, and I would put four in, actually. Um, yeah, so this this is gentle. Um, I'm not saying that you couldn't possibly get strange radiation. But when you're putting in things like uh, calcium carbonate, there's plenty of carbon in there. When you're putting in things like poultry, when you're putting in foodstuffs, there's lots and lots and lots of carbon in there. And therefore, you're unlikely to get the strange radiation forming because it prevents the extreme coherence. So uh, perhaps size does matter. Actually, I think it's the longer you leave it in there. So what I've already seen in my ultra experiments is that if you run them for a little amount of time, you just get a few elements. Uh, if you run them for a lot longer, you get a lot of elements. And uh, you get spread across the periodic table. In fact, I'm going to bring up the Cladoff work from uh, 1997 to 2002. 
It is in my presentation that I gave in a CZ last year. So let, let me just get that. Um, I can find it. Give me a second. Uh, what do we call it? La di da di da. I, uh, Does anyone here know what a toroidal dipole is? Okay, all right. <laughs> I'll have to run with this. I can't. I can't find the presentation quick. So uh, that's my ugly mug on stage, and I asked the audience, "Did they know what a toroidal dipole is?" And they didn't. Um, okay, so uh, what am I looking for here? Oh, what am I looking for here? I'm looking for. Blah 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 blah. Okay. Where's Clados work? That's over here, isn't it? Clados, 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 Clados. There. Okay. So, in Clados' um, system, two hours of processing led to the production of nineteen elements. Eight hours, twenty-three elements. Twenty-four hours. 29 elements and 360 hours of processing 55 elements and the same kind of observation was uh, independently and around the similar time uh, observed by uh, our good friend Dr. Roisha Namaza um, here uh, and he put a patent out and uh, he observed uh, a wide production of magnesium, zinc, calcium, aluminium, copper, sodium, potassium and selenium uh, after 100 hours so it's, it's less intense um, than that uh, and in terms of destruction of matter uh, we know it, it involves a uh, weak interaction because Kladov was able to re remediate um, season 137 and the uh, hydrowave technology that was uh, used to destroy chemical and biological weapons uh, from the former Soviet Union when they ran out of stuff to destroy safely they said, well, let's see if this Kladoff guy has got anything uh, going that's the truth. And between 2006 and 2009, they verified his work. And they also found that uh, uh, with strontium-90, which is another uh, beta isotope, uh, they could uh, remediate that very, very quickly using this cavitation process. Interestingly, in this process, they, as part of the process, they, they actually uh, have an electrical discharge in the water that then goes into the um, uh, cavitator, and, and the cavitator is like a, a, a it's a, like a two discs, and then it has like a increasingly small like uh, um, waves on there. So you, you're going through ranges of different frequencies, and um, the actual process will be the fractal toroidal structures in there. But because they put um, they disassociated with the charge, they'll be dissolved. Uh, gases in there but there will also be HHO effectively in there so it, it, it is the same process effectively um, going on um, and, and and that's it really so uh, the, the more more time you run it the smaller the bits get but also the more variation of elements you get so um, that's it and, and we observe this in 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 um, uh, HHO experiments Sorry, Gordon. Well, we're pretty much finished. Um, yeah, uh, it, this for me is potentially, it's kind of like on the sort of complexity of experiment probably as uh, a Vega experiment, um, but without the, the high temperatures involved. You basically need a compressor, a heat exchanger, and to build a vessel of the right, right size, and I think that would probably do it. Um, can we disassociate CO2? I don't think we need to worry about dealing with those kind of things, uh, 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 Cosmic Dave, because 
you know, by properly using this technology, we can solve most of the other programs pro problems that lead to the excuses for moaning about CO2, which they want to tax us on, which is probably why they don't want a real solution. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to read some of your comments here and I'll answer questions. Any idea how much power in the compressor? I'm pretty sure that there would be it would be more efficient to use the power in that compressor. So for instance, like uh, I thought, how could this be useful? Well, you could convert things that wouldn't ordinarily easily combust into things that would combust easily. And they could provide power for driving a compressor and the, the excess heat could be used for preheating the gas. Uh, secondly, you can convert uh, stuff that isn't high grade food into food additives because the the, the th those things may still have a lot of nutrients and good nutrients that would ordinarily be wasted okay so you've got to consider the in energy cycle and the embodied energy for instance in fruit and vegetables and in meat and whatever th that would ordinarily be wasted that you would save and it might be that the energy you put in allows you to recover high grade food uh, that is uh, way in excess of the energy that was would be wasted by throwing that stuff away Moreover, I've considered, you know, at the end of my growing season, I have these huge pieces of, of uh, grass from my sweet corn. And, you know, in my, in my compost heap, they might take three or four years to compost down. Now, what happens if I can convert that into a fine powder that I can plow straight back into the soil? Okay, then I'm um, immediately recycling that stuff. It's much more accessible to the bacteria. It's much more accessible to the the um, uh, to the plants. Uh, you know, so yeah, it's kind of like pre-digesting cellulose. So you you could even you could convert th things that were not easy to convert into alcohols, for instance. You could you could you could mash that up. Um, I actually suspect potentially that coming out of the top. If you got the wind hex to a sufficient degree of intensity, and maybe you put some uh, uh, charges in there, in a way, you might actually get out coming out of the top hydrogen and oxygen. Like the water is not actually just uh, being boiled off; some of it's coming off as in a gas. So I, I don't know. Well, yeah, I know, I know, I know it would be great for for these kind of things, uh, uh, Cosmic Dave. But uh, you know, I applied to the 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 fund there, and uh, well, anyway, I, I shall talk about that another time. So, uh, Alex de Castillo, del Castillo, I think the disruption zone is a focal point uh, for the beams of dark matter through which ordinary matter come and and it, it it's it's either pulling the 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 dark matter out of the material so that the atoms lose their ordinary ability to hold together um uh something like that but it, it is it's influencing the electrons and since we know that that the the cold neutrinos influence the electrons i think that's something like what is going on the, does it happen? Uh, absolutely, it absolutely happens. This this is this is a real thing. It really happened. It really really happened. This is a real thing. It really really happened. All of those, you know, it's it's lucky that we get to see this from the side. It's lucky that we get to see this from the side, okay? Because in many other circumstances, we observe these things uh, in the other orientation, so we don't get to see how they are working uh, um but uh in my view he throws the can up here and it doesn't y y the thing about throwing the can up here and it, 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 this is just a logic thing for me if the tornado is just sucking from here all the way up and it would just come out the can would just fly out the top it would just fly out the top right but it doesn't. And and why why would the can fly up through the center of the tornado and then deviate off to the side to get into the vortexes up on the top right or on the top left in this diagram? It wouldn't. That isn't what is happening. The can, the glass bottle, the, the things that he throws from the bottom here is being destroyed here. It's being destroyed here. 
The effort that they went to to make sure you couldn't use this, but craft food could process food so that you could buy it off them for decades. You know, and like I don't think the craft foods ones are necessarily as powerful as some of the ones that were uh, tested by uh, Plevka. Okay, I don't. I don't think they were as powerful, and I don't think Plevkas, as I've argued are sufficiently power i think if i chucked a load of welding rods in there it wouldn't come out as carbon right but that's what's happening here the welding rod is being converted into carbon and most likely protons electrons and um uh what should we say helium okay that's what i think you'll probably find is going on here okay but carbon is the first thing you see because it's the highest melting point element okay and it is non-spin so it just gets deposited okay so um this is far more intense than the the wind hex but the wind hex could be made like that and for me it's it's exciting to think that i can massively increase the amount of food that i can process for later consumption in the year okay that would otherwise be wasted okay and um uh the other, the other thing is, is that if we can reveal the event horizon here, the event horizon here, we would have this incredible ability to carve things and uh, cut things out. And you could literally make these to any scale you like. And you could handle this bit almost like a pen. You know, I can, I can imagine that some, something like that. It, that. That is, you know, I, I think we're, we're, in my view... You know, I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but this is real. What I'm seeing here is real. And what I showed you that was being conducted by uh, Mr. Pelevka in this presentation here. Uh, uh, I think this one's probably the best one. Yeah. Everyone knows the destructive talk during a summer. He is not throwing that out of the top of the thing he's throwing it into the destruction zone and it comes down and he's perfectly happy to have his hand there <laughs> yeah i kind of like that cosmic dave the dremel tornado drill corky that would be great having an illustration yeah but i think since we I believe that we understand what the geometry is. Because we understand the geometry, we can make very precise structures to do this. But it's, as I say, this is such a tolerant technology. You cannot fail with an ultra experiment. And it does this. It does this. And it makes heavier and lighter elements. And it even completely collapses matter. Uh, you could potentially watch the process if the comb was made from acrylic. That's very interesting. You would also see how much it gets damaged. Maybe acrylic isn't the best one. You you would want something that, you know, maybe... is Does acrylic get positive charges when you rub it? One, one, one of the... I think acrylic might get positive charges. So it, it might be beneficial. It might just pull things to the side. You might, you might want to get... Is it nylon gets negative charge? You might want to make it, but nylon's not clear. So you, you'd want to choose a, a, a clear material. I don't think quartz is going to do it. I don't think glass is going to do it. Mmm, powdered food. <laughs> You'll probably be surprised how much food you eat that's been formally powdered. Yeah, Corky, it's the scoop box. I, 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 I'm, I'm... I am moving towards being fairly confident that the scoop marks are probably caused uh, by a tool that uses this sacred technology. And and it's like, it's one principle that underpins an entire civilization. Energy production, anti-gravity, uh, potentially the production of uh, materials for geopolymers, the uh, uh, an effortless, just completely effortless. Right, now, how are they doing it? Well, you could create copper pipes and you could create a big boiler and boil water and pass that as high-pressure steam through a valve. 
That could be as, as simple as it needs to be. They had copper, right? They were well adept at metal manipulation, right? They could have quite reasonably produced a copper boiling vessel. And then they just produced several jet jets, right? Okay. Um, and the steam, you, know, you get it up to dry steam. I don't know. That might be enough. Okay, so I'm going to try and get as many questions as I can answered in the next 10 minutes because it's nearly midnight here and I have some important things I need to do. Um, would copper be better than metal? Copper, I, I do believe, would be good for a couple of reasons. One, it uh, doesn't absorb hydrogen. Uh, the, the reason it's not good is that it's a spin metal and so it'll get ripped into there so <laughs> uh so i i would suggest you need something like steel uh which is non-magnetic although like i say that i don't think this is too powerful i think what is powerful is going on at this disruption zone down here something really powerful is going on at this disruption zone and material might fly up a little bit and it just goes around and trickles down the edges and it just passes passes the disruption zone. Okay. Yeah, what am I doing? I would not stick my hand in there. I think it would be a little bit like... Um, it's a bit like when you get a, a Mars a gas or HHO and you put it on your hand. Until it rips all the water out, leaving carbon, i.e., uh, what do they call it? Um, not hydrolyzing. It's, um, oh God, what, what is it? It's, it's when you rip all the water out and you just leave carbon behind. When you get carbon, then you it will heat up, right? So um, because of the excitement of the electrons, I think, some, something like that is going on. Um so I, I, he obviously is not concerned. So the when you look at this diagram of his actual patent and you line up where it can only be, the disruption zone is a fair distance above the port. And so, um, you know, it's not it's not going to uh, you, you wouldn't have an issue. I'm afraid we're going to have to do this ourselves. We're going to have to do this ourselves. Uh, it's, you know, but we, we need to respect it. We need to respect it. If they tell us it's not possible and it's a patent that's already expired, well, what are they going to do? Get really, really, really annoyed? I don't know. But I must say, we must remember this from Matthew 5.5. 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And the original meaning of the Greek praus uh, means strength under control. Okay? And so the real meaning of that phrase is those that know that they have no those that know they have great power, but choose not to use it shall inherit the earth, right? So you can push this to the max. And it is not good. This is O'Day slide one oh one, by the way, and one hundred was this. The future will prove the past. And uh, I can tell you that it's been obvious to me for over half a decade now that there's literally no coincidence. It's not a coincidence that they chose to have an ancient guy in an Arab outfit looking at a pyramid, like going, yeah, this is in my hand. And then, you know, this futuristic woman looking up at a pyramid going, that's what we've got to aspire to. And uh, in each view, you have a an obelisk in the background. This is not a coincidence, okay? They know that this is the technology. And you're not allowed to know because it does 
literally things that look like magic but it's not something we can't see because we can see it in the windex right it actually does that on a massive scale yeah alex del castillo there's so many ways you can use this technology it literally boggles the mind as i said at Aarhus university many years ago I said, at some point, there will be whole universities that have different departments that will uh, apply themselves to uh, aspects of what this technology can do. You can make all the elements you want, okay? Uh, and, you know, you can, you can make elements into nothing. You can make nothing into elements. Um, you can grind up your materials for your you know, feedstocks for your processes very, very efficiently. I believe it's very, very efficient. Certainly when you consider that many of the things that you could produce useful products from would ordinarily be wasted and they take a lot of energy to make. Okay. Finally get rid of your chicken beaks. Yes, exactly. I remember going to uh, Los Roques off the coast of Venezuela. Very lucky once. And there, and in a lot of those uh, Caribbean islands, there are mountains of conch shells. Like, they're, they're almost a sad reminder to the decimation of these poor creatures, which are very, very good uh, and easy to catch but very good to eat but they're, they're sitting ducks really um and you could get rid of those and, and give that back you know um just all over the world you can clean up so many things with this really relatively trivially yeah simon claret like like i think you could produce metal powders for 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 uh direct laser metal sintering yeah yeah, I think so. Um, now, would you get the same metal out that you put in if you didn't push it too hard? Probably. Okay, I'm going to look through. So, hi, Crypto Alchemist. Great for joining us. And hi, DO Projects with uh, Chalxis. Have you read T.T. Brown's daughter's book? No, I haven't. Uh, if you have and you have some interesting things in there, I'd be very interested to see what that uh, reveals. Uh, I don't know what they had on the top of the Great Pyramid. I know... I've seen in the Cairo Museum one of the other pyramid capstones and I think it was just granite. I have some extremely nice photos of that which I'll share in due course. Do not expect anyone to help you solve this problem, right? <laughs> The, the point of the MFMP was to show that something is possible and when it's shown that it's possible to educate on what is possible to do with it. Uh, I could not have expected it to go the way it has in terms of uh, getting to a point where you, you can see literally with massive physical uh, evidence what it can do. It can literally turn the hardest materials known to man into small grey powders. Okay. Um, you know, silicon dioxide eats it for breakfast. Expect very fine powdered dust. Concrete, expect very fine powdered dust. Aluminium, expect it to be dustified. Uh, uh, tungsten, yeah, not a problem. A lot of this stuff will end up as gases. Do I believe in supersymmetry? Um, yeah. Do I need to? <laughs> Do I need to? You know, there's a lot of people that don't know how most of what they use in their life works. And I don't know, you know, do you need to know everything? I don't think so. 
Um, but I'm quite interested in what's going on in this wind hex, and I think probably we know. I, I, I do believe that there are magnetic charges, if, if, if that's a form of symmetry to the electric charge, and I think that it's a structure, just as probably an electron is a structure, okay? People say it's a fundamental particle, but then when you get, you know, two, an electron and positron annihilate, they produce two photons. And so, like, they're at least made up of electromagnetic energy that's trapped in a, its own structure. What is that structure? Hmm. Yeah, that's my point, Space Case. Uh, copper makes good steam boilers. They had copper. They could make little pipes. They could do that. And they could boil water. They, I believe that they could create a, a equivalent of one of these devices. I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't some hieroglyphs that look a little bit similar to this structure. But anyway, you know. Uh, steel is a metal, but uh, if you choose your elements wisely, like it's like carbon steel, let's say, uh, and uh, you, you, there's only whatever it is, 2% or whatever is a spin nuclei, and um, if it's just predominantly iron. So, you, you know, you could you could choose maybe a ferrosilicon steel, um, with, you know, silicon, carbon, so on, because... Uh, the silicon itself is mostly non-spin nuclear. It's 28 and 30. Uh, the iron is mostly, uh, you know, 54, 56, 58. Uh, it hasn't got 57. I think, I think that's right. Um, so uh, you, mostly you want non-spin. But I just, I just don't think that in a wind hex you're going to get really sufficiently high toroidal moments in a location where it's going to destroy metals. That remember, the location I'm saying is here or inside the fractal toroids, okay? But the fractal toroids are already held off by the fluid dynamics from the metal structures, okay? So, you know, it's it, it it's it's like the um, rarefraction pulse heaters. You, you are generating the uh, fractal toroidal structures in the center of the fluid dynamic structure so that when it does its work it's there and when you turn off the power it's not being energized so it stops working so it you know that's good Okay, what I'm what I'll probably do is um, I would go and uh, sorry I would go and read uh, if you can and d help me here the paper uh, sorry the um, website on on uh, vortices and and tornadoes. I I think the the tornado mystery is this, and I hope to discuss the finer details with Matsumoto in the coming weeks in person and uh, I'm very much looking forward to that uh, because he's observed very similar structures to the ones that I am sharing here and actually called it out as tornadoes. He said the same processes are probably what cause volcanoes and I would agree having made something similar with HHO on uh, Indium. He literally sh showed the eruptions from the so-called volcanoes and so you know, you could literally have an environment where you have a hollow earth, but the inside is actually got a skin that's incredibly dense. And then the volcanoes aren't actually anything that's coming from inside the earth. It's actually coming up and and it's just a big evo under the ground that's churning up rocks. I mean, there's, there's ways to completely reimagine how the earth is structured uh, and, and still have the, the overall fields and whatever. So, but I don't think it's necessary to go there. You don't have to change everything at once. Uh, um, let, let, let's start with making practical devices. And I believe the wind hex uh, by Pelefka um, is a good demonstration of what I would call Atlantean technology.
Yeah, for all those out there that want to dismiss me, Hollow Earth. I'm never going to say Flat Earth. I'm going to say Hollow Earth. <laughs> all right? That's my little bit of crazy. <laughs> I say hollow earth because we literally create iron-rich crenellated spheres that have silicon dioxide and calcium dioxide on the outside, which is almost all of the mass of the earth, right? Those things, okay? Done. <laughs> and on the inside, we know it has something which is not ordinary matter because in the cover of Alexander Parkhamov's book and in so many other examples that we have shared, you get stuff spewing out which forms carbon, right? Okay, out, out of a, a pole... Okay, out of the, I think where the the Sothic triangle interacts with the, with the uh, uh, the sphere, and and so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Rob, this this device here is mega mega practical. I because we know because you can see it as I said earlier, we know a hundred percent we can actually make this small <laughs> because of the tens of micron scale of the tungsten underneath. Um, uh, the question is, can we get the speed of the the airflow up or the steam flow or whatever? I suspect we can. I suspect we can because we get it in ultra. It's the same thing going on in ultra. So, like, you know, I, I, I think it would be surprisingly easy. Just you have to do it. <laughs> you have to believe it's possible and then do it. <laughs> well, I don't, uh, you know, I... The thing is, so, so uh, Cosmic Dave said we can d d dig a hole into the hollow earth. I don't know whether you can because um, you will get to this ultra dense part and you won't be able to go inside. Uh, you, you're, you're, you're getting to this sphere. It's kind of like the sphere that, yeah, anyway. Um, you can go to remoteview.icu, Simon Cla Claret, and... Uh, um, you can register there and then send a direct message and I'll get back to you. Uh, yeah, well, the heart is kind of sort of similar geometry. Anyway, the, 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 the point is is that uh, uh, whatever's going on in nature, it's trying to use often this efficient process. It's trying to. <laughs> all right so um i'm just gonna wrap up here so thanks for everyone that joined me today this was ode explaining frank palefka's wind hex and uh, very quickly uh, we had already seen in an ultra experiment by thomas kaminsky thank you uh, from the us uh, uh, a structure in an ultra experiment that produced a vortex we'd already seen in the lion experiment something that had um, some offset things that were able to drill through fused quartz we were able to see vortex structures in other ultra experiments and this comported with what was claimed by matsumoto and that the patent uh, of the uh, frank polifka uh, is simple and to cut a very long story short, um, I believe it is uh, the same process that we have observed in very many different um, experiments. And that... Everyone knows the destructive power of a tornado during a summer storm. Now, Kansas inventor Frank Polifka has harnessed this power in a tornado machine. And in that, we have showed that he throws material into the bottom. And if you believe the mainstream concept of how this works, you would imagine that it just goes sucked straight up and out the top, right? But I don't believe that's what it is. There is this destruction zone that we have identified in our work. And 
I believe that is where it literally is exploded, as is described, and I think he was correct. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to uh, be able to share this with you today, and I will see you in the next video. Buenas noches, dobranots, good night.